Amen. Thank you for that. I do have some artists in here, right? Coloring. We're going to need your help in a little bit. Before that, uh, I need to talk to the adults. So kids, feel free to not listen. <laughs> I see a big kid back there. <laughs> so what do you got going on this Christmas? Something going on in your life where you got a decision to make? It might, might be that God is calling you to finish up with a relationship and put it behind you. It might God, be that God is calling you to double down on this relationship and dig in and make it work. It might be that God is calling you to change jobs. It might be he's calling you away from the job you're at. It might be that God is calling you to stay right where you're at, dig deep, figure out how to do it with integrity, and do it well. It might be that God is calling you to move. It might I hope not, but it might be that he's calling you to change locations. Unless you're on the live stream and you think about moving to Allegan, then it's definitely God's will that you move to Allegan. I don't know, maybe he's calling you to move, maybe he's calling you to stay. We're going to see examples of all of these things this morning as we look through the Christmas story. What's God doing in your life? What is he calling you toward? What is he calling you away from? This is what it looked like in uh, Joseph's life. You guys know the story of Joseph and Mary, where the angel comes to Joseph and tells him to marry Mary. Well, the, the angel did that because Joseph had decided that he was going to divorce Mary. He had made up his mind that it was time for him to put this relationship, it was time for it to be done. He was going to divorce her. He was going to do it quietly, but he was going to move on. And then something happened. The angel shows up. And Joseph learns something and decides to marry Mary. And I'm, I guess I'm asking you to listen to this story with me, read this story with me, and say, what did Joseph learn about God that helped him make that decision? What would be transfer, transferable to your life? What could you learn that would help you turn? That would help you move forward with confidence? Because of what you now know about God. That's my goal as we look through this, is to help you see what's, what's true about God, what Joseph learned about God, and what can help you as you make decisions in the future. So if you have your Bibles open with you, um, or with you, go ahead and open them with me to Matthew chapter, chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 18. Before we do that, I'd like to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, I pray that you would stand in front of me while I'm in front of them, that you talk over me while I talk to them. And Lord, that you help people with the decisions that they're making and unmaking and making again. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we go. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. Who's coloring a picture? Anybody coloring a picture about that? Awesome. We'll see it in just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. We're going to have you stand up. Hold it up. Good. Thank you for that. Keep working on it. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So Joseph finds out Mary's pregnant, doesn't know the whole story, but decides this is not going to work. We've got to end the relationship. Resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Don't be afraid. Man, that, that 
command comes up so often in the Bible. Do not fear. Hopefully you learned something about God this, during this, in this passage that would help you not be afraid. That would help you make decisions. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Anybody working on that picture? Can you guess which picture that is? Anybody working on that one? Oh, thank you. Yeah, you're working on that one? Anybody else? Okay, good. Thanks, guys. Keep, keep working on it. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name. Anybody coloring that know what the baby's name is going to be? Yeah, what do you think? Jesus. That's right. Very good. The old name is named Jesus. I'm sorry. Old pastor got ahead of himself, didn't he? <laughs> he was named Jesus, but in this case, it's Emmanuel. Good thing there's a text up there. Nathan doesn't lie to you. Call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. So he took his wife. He got married. He changed directions. He had decided he was going to divorce her. Now he decides he's going to marry her based on what the angel told him about his wife, but also about what the angel told him about God. So he didn't call his name Jesus because you'll save his people from their sins, and this is to fill what the prophet told Isaiah. You'll be called his name Emmanuel because it means God with us. But he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. All right. What did Joseph learn about God? Well, that is transferable. Well, I think what Joseph learned about God is that God is with us. So here is one of the Bailey kids' interpretation of this picture. Here is another interpretation of this picture. And here is Connor Van Valkenburg's interpretation of this picture. Anybody else color this picture? All right, uh, Adam, can you zoom in over here, and can you guys stand up? If you have your pictures, just stand up and hold it up to the live stream, and we'll see if we can move the camera over there. Oh, it's this camera. I'm sorry. It's this camera we're using. That makes sense. All right. Can you guys got it? Adam, can you just give me a thumbs up when you get it? You're zooming, okay. It's a slow zoom, so we don't get, give the people on the live stream motion, motion sickness. <laughs> All right, we got that one. All right, now we got to come up here and get these guys. They, they did this. So hold it up to this, which camera? This one, okay. So go ahead and hold it up to this camera over here, guys. This camera right up here. Give me a thumbs up when you got it. Yeah, we're right up here. Keep going. Okay, we're good. Very good. Jesus is God keeping his promises to be with us. You know, I was talking to um, one of my counseling professors in seminary. This guy has a Ph.D. in uh, psychology, developmental psych, actually. So he uh, did his Ph.D. in counseling kids. And he also had a, he has the same master's degree I do in biblical um, theology, pastoral ministry. He, yeah, he lives in both worlds. Does a lot of counseling, and, and he said, you know, the, the common theme he found when he's working with people is people tend to see God through the lens of their dad. So if their dad was never there, they really have a hard time believing that God is there. So if their dad was always angry, 
they tend to think that God is always angry. So if their dad said things and then didn't do them, they tend to think that the Heavenly Father will say things and not do them. If their dad made promises that he didn't keep, they have a really hard time believing that the Heavenly Father will make and keep promises. So I have really good news for you. That, that those of you, when I say that, you're going, boy, I, I feel like that's true. The really good news is the Heavenly Father is not your earthly father. He's not. We might, it is hard like to separate dear Heavenly Father from our earthly father. That is hard. But it must be done. And the way to do it is to get to know God through this word. That's the first thing I'd say. It's really good news. Your heavenly father is not your earthly father. On the other hand, dad, your kids are learning about the heavenly father through you. You're getting stuff right. Probably there's stuff you're not getting so right. Please dial that in. Please, for the sake of your kids. And a good place to start is do what you say you will do. Be trustworthy. So that one day they can trust their Heavenly Father. Jesus is God with us. So this is the Emmanuel. This is God keeping his promises to show up. And indeed, he does in the person of Jesus. Joseph knows he can trust God because God keeps his promise to show up. Okay? So, it also means, part of what him being Emmanuel means is that he will save his people from their sins. So, I think saving his people from their sins includes two different truths. The first truth is that it means he will forgive us for our sins. So, of course, that points forward to the cross, how Jesus will forgive us for our sins. Did anybody here do a picture or color a picture of Jesus dying on the cross? Anybody in here do that one? Okay, very good. So, in justice, uh, actually, go ahead and with his live stream, let's start zooming in over here. Go ahead and stand up, and then let's hold it up to that camera, right, Adam? We're over here. There you go. Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Here's, while you're zooming over there, here's another interpretation of this one. Connor did another one of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Hold, give me a thumbs up when you got him. Got him. Okay, very good. Thanks, guys. Do you have a hard time believing that Jesus really does forgive our sins? I mean, I think, I think, I'm just looking around. I mean, I think everybody here cognitively knows Jesus will forgive our sins. But maybe there's part of you, or maybe part of you on the live stream going, I don't know, dude. I've got some really old sins. Really old. You know, the kind that, the kind that haunt me at night that took place 50 years ago, like really old, old sins. I don't know, I don't know. And I guess what I'd say to you is, what do you know about time? God picked you. This is what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says, that he picked you, he called you, before the foundations of the world. What do you know about old? He can forgive old sins. You might be going, well, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I've got some really new sins. Like, sins I committed this morning. I've got to punish myself for these for quite some time before I can confess these. I'd say, that's stupid. <laughs> Lamentations 3.22 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. 
The sins you committed this morning. Man, his grace is new every morning. He's ready for you. Come to him with old sins. Come to him with new sins. You might be saying, I don't know, man. My sins are really, really secret. What do you know of secrets? He knows how many hairs are on your head. You don't have any secrets. Not from him. He'll forgive your secret sins. You might say, my sins, my sins, man, they're too public. He died in public for your public sins. I don't know where you're at. You might be saying, my sins, they're too big. They're just too big. You know, Romans chapter 5, verse 20 says that as our sins abound, his grace super abounds. Like our sins get big, well, his grace is huge. That his grace, we've said this before, is bigger and stronger and better than all of our sins. But you might be saying, I don't know, dude, I've got so many little sins. It's like getting stung with self-inflicted wounds by a metric ton of mosquitoes. His grace is bigger than all of that. He died for all of these sins. This is why it's really good news. God is with us to forgive sins. If you're in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Why don't you say it out loud with me? My sins are forgiven. My sins are forgiven. That's what it means for him to be with us. My sins are forgiven. God is with us to forgive our sins. God is with us to free us from sin. So save us from sins has two parts to it. The first part is forgive our sins. The second part is to save us from our sins. Here's a, an interpretation of Matthew at his tax collector booth. This is in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 through 12. Matthew at his chapter tax collector booth. There is another interpretation of Matthew at his tax collector booth. And here is a third interpretation of Matthew at his tax collector booth. That one is by Asher the Smith. Anybody here do Matthew at the tax collector booth? Over here, man, you guys are like machines over here, you Augustines. That's so great. So right back over here, Adam, you guys know the drill. Hold it up to that camera there and give me the thumbs up when you've got... Oh, we also have one up front after you get the Augustines. Did you do the Matthew at the tax collector booth too? You're just stretching? Okay. <laughs> we good over here? Okay, now we're coming up here, very front row. So while we're zooming in, you have to try to figure out why there's an arrow at Matthew's ankle. Anyone want to take a shot at why there's an arrow at Matthew's ankle? Only I know. You're never going to guess. Here's why. Give me a thumbs up when you got it, Adam. Okay, we got it. Thank you, sir. There's There's an arrow at Matthew's ankle because... I just want you to see there's no chain holding Matthew to this job. There's not a chain. He doesn't have to stay. He doesn't have to. Except that he does. You know what's keeping Matthew at this job? Making money. There's something else that's keeping Matthew chained to that desk. And it is money. And, and the problem is not making money. Making money is good. We're for flourishing. We're for making money. What, what's wrong is Matthew made his money by stealing from people in the name of the Roman government. Like, so the, the Israelite people associated this job with the worst kind of sins you can think of because they made their living by stealing from their own people. This is not a job you could do and hold on to your integrity. Maybe at all, maybe you could. Maybe you could hold on to your integrity, but most of them didn't. It'd at least be very hard to hang on to your integrity. 
And so people just associated this job with sin. So why does Matthew stay? He stays because the money is really, really, really good. And Jesus comes to him and says, Matthew, come follow me. And he leaves it all and he follows Jesus. Matthew is stuck. We think this is the guy who wrote the book, Matthew. He was stuck. And Jesus got him unstuck by calling him. He got unstuck by obeying and following. So let me ask you, are you stuck? Are you stuck in a relationship where you're like, I can't leave. I can't. It's been too long. Are you stuck in a job where you're like, I can't leave. I can't. I have too much to lose. Are you stuck? Are you stuck in a habit where you're like, I don't know what else to do. This is, this is all I know. Here's, why, here's, here's the good news to me. When the Apostle Paul talks about change and calls us to change, he doesn't talk really too much about gradual improvement. He talks about it more like dying and rising from the dead. Like you have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer you who live, but Christ. So you're raised to newness of life. So, so if you just try to gradually move away from that stuff, it's probably not going to work. You have to realize, like Matthew, he would have just said, you know, I am dead to that old way of life. And I have been raised to newness of life, which is following Jesus. I'm not going back to that. So you can't just kind of gradually leave it. Its talons are in too deep. It's got to be a clean, bloody, hard break. Kind of like death. Kind of like resurrection. As Matthew is called to newness of life. And you and I call to newness of life. One more picture. God is with us to forgive our sins, to free us from sin, and to work out his good plan. How old were you when you realized that life doesn't go according to your plans? I've learned that lesson several times. And I just have to say, I haven't really learned it yet. Like, I'm still learning it again and again and again and again. Like, it's one that I am just too stubborn to learn. My brother, I think maybe I told you, my brother-in-law injured himself again, you know, for like the 10th time or something. And he said to me, Nathan, this is a lesson I will not learn. I will not learn to stretch before I sprint. Like, I just won't learn the lesson. And I have lessons like that too. And one of them is, I keep thinking my plans will work. I keep thinking my plans will come through. Like, I plan to not be a pastor. <laughs> Here we are, you know. Like, do you have any plans? Like, do, do, do your plans go through? Like, have you learned that lesson yet? Like, I planned to not have a fifth kid. And then when I got my head around, we're going to have the fifth kid, the fifth kid died. Like, uh, <laughs> Joseph planned to marry Mary, then planned to divorce Mary, then said, okay, I'll marry Mary. But he probably didn't plan to adopt Jesus all the way back in the beginning. And then I'm sure he wasn't planning to run for his life to Egypt. That's what that picture is up there. Them running for their lives, them fleeing like refugees from Herod's destruction. That's not part of Joseph's plan. But God had a really good plan for Joseph. And God has a really good plan for you. Anybody do this picture? Okay. Oh, another one over here? Oh, no. Okay, you're just... Oh, is that your picture up there? Very nice, Charlie. Yes. All right, so we got a couple in the front row here, Adam. Go ahead and uh, give me a thumbs up when we, when we have them. Okay. 
Okay, we got them. Good. Thank you, men. God is with us to forgive our sins, to free us from sins, and to work his good plan. So here's what this looked like in Joseph's life. Joseph had decided that he was going to divorce Mary. And after learning that God is with us, he learned some stuff about Mary too, but he learned that God is with us, that God is here to save us from our sins, and that all of this is part of God's plan, like he prophesied long ago through the prophet Isaiah. Joseph switched directions. He repented. Some of you have recognized that arrow from the weeks we spent on it in the Beatitudes. I realize that I think Joseph is the first guy to repent in the book of Matthew. I didn't realize that before. What would that repentance look like in your life? Matthew 4.17 says, And Jesus came preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see this in Joseph's life. What does this look like in your life as you have these questions of like, what should I do? What should I do in this relationship? Is it time for it to end or is it time to take the next step? Is it time for me to leave my job or is it time for me to dig in and stay at my job and glorify God in the way I work? Is it time for us to move? Or is it time for us to find a way to rejoice in the Lord where we are? Is it time for this habit to end? Time to start a new and better habit? What is the Lord pressing on in your life that you would repent and turn to him? May he give you courage to make this change as you trust him this Christmas. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this text and the freedom that you give us as you free us from sin, as you forgive our sins, as you remind us that you have a good plan for our lives. Lord, pull us towards yourself. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.